everyone, and welcome back. Uh, so in this video, we're going to go through infections of the respiratory system. Uh, so like I've done in my other videos, uh, we'll start the conversation by talking about um, the anatomy of the respiratory system. So uh, you can take a look here again. This is not uh, designed for to be a, designed to be an anatomy and physiology lesson, uh, but just to give you an idea what we're looking at in terms of our upper respiratory tract. Uh, we're also in go going to include things uh, with the ears in this because of how those feed in to the respiratory tract. And, and quite honestly, uh, a lot of things that cause problems with your ears, they start here. They start in your oral pharynx or your nasal pharynx, and they get pushed into there. So like ear infections, for example, are often the result of that. I'm moving down to the lower respiratory tract. We're looking at things like the larynx, the trachea. Um, we're talking about things that happen in the lungs. So when we start talking about things like tuberculosis and pneumonia. This is where we're going to end up being. And you can feel free to come back and look at these slides uh, when you need to. But uh, I just like to put that out there, uh, even though it's not really the focus of this particular conversation. So let's start with bacterial infections of the respiratory tract. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is bacterial pharyngitis. Uh, this is something that you probably know. Uh, commonly referred to as strep throat, all right? And the reason I, I want to discourage that is while Streptococcus pyogenes uh, is the most prevalent cause of bacterial pharyngitis, there are other bacteria that can cause pharyngitis, uh, the most notable of which is Fusobacterium necroforum. So uh, in, in terms of the two ones that we're going to focus on uh, for this video, Streptococcus pyogenes is a gram-positive Streptococcus, uh, and Fusobacterium necroforum is a gram-negative rod, so, so they're different than aspect. Um, signs and symptoms of bacterial pharyngitis, uh, I, I'm going to guess that most of us have probably either had this at some point in our life or know someone who has. So high fever, so you're looking at like 102, 103, 104, uh, sore throat, um, because obviously this is problematic. And then you're going to see this bright red inflammation at the back of the throat. You might even start to see some pus forming, depending on how advanced uh, the infection is when you observe it. Uh, so this is a disease that's fairly readily transmitted, either through direct contact with, with fluids uh, or through respiratory droplets. So if you know somebody who has it, keep your distance. Um, and then uh, diagnosis for this, uh, there are the most, the, the traditional way of doing this is by doing uh, a throat culture. You do a bacterial culture of the throat. You use one of those like six inch cotton swabs, stick it in the back. It's as somebody who spent the majority of his childhood with various cases of strep throat, tonsillitis, ear infections, I've had far too many of these. And whenever I see those six inch strips in lab, I'm like, oh, those six inch sticks, because I've had too many of those uh, used to do one of those bacterial throat cultures. Um, in recent years, in the past decade or two, they've developed a rapid strep test that can give you a, a diagnosis of streptococcal infection almost immediately. Uh, but there is a caution on this is that these rapid strep tests only detect streptococcus pyogenes. Um, and I know people personally who have gone in because they think that they have strep throat, they do a rapid strep, comes back negative, they're sent home basically saying, well, it's probably a virus, it might be allergies, only to be suffering from the same condition three or four days later. Then they go back and get the, the, the actual throat culture done to find out they have Fusobacterium necroforum, all right? Um, treatment for these is the same uh, antibiotics, um, but... It depends on the causative agent. So we're dealing with a gram-positive streptococcus in the case of strep pyogenes, and we're dealing with a gram-negative rod in the case of Fusobacterium necroforum. So, uh, for example, uh, azithromycin works great against strep pyo. It's not going to work against Fusobacterium. So uh, getting a proper diagnosis is important here. Uh, complications. So streptococcus pyogenes has a number of different issues that can arise from that type of infection. So scarlet fever, you may have heard of this. The book, The Velveteen Rabbit is, a bad case, uh, is about a bad case of this. This is something that actually killed people a long time ago. Um, glomerulonephritis is an inflammation of the kidneys uh, that results as... Um, as a result of a streptococcal infection, rheumatic fever uh, can cause damage and inflammation to the heart as a result of this. And then more serious complications associated with streptococcus pyogenes infection are endocarditis and sepsis. Um, endocarditis, rheumatic fever, glomerulonephritis, those are often the result of an untreated streptococcal infection. So one thing I really need to stress about this, uh, about streptococcus pyogenes and a lot of strep species in general, if you have an infection with a streptococcal species that's causing something like uh, bacterial pharyngitis, 
take every last dose of that antibiotic because what often happens is people will take the antibiotic until they feel better and then, well, I'm foot fixed now. I don't need to do this anymore. This is a way to actually encourage antibiotic resistance. You need to take the full dose. And this really goes for any infection, but you need to take the full dose of the antibiotic to make sure that you're killing off those that are even strongly resistant to the antibiotic. Time can help overcome that barricade. The other problem is this. If you don't get rid of all of it, streptococcus pyogenes tends to find its way eventually to other parts of your body, namely the heart, most first and foremost, or the kidneys. And you can develop uh, infections that won't arise until years later. And the next thing you know, you're having complications with your heart and you find out that a streptococcal infection is like eating away your mitral valve or something like that. So if you get diagnosed with this or your child gets diagnosed with this or somebody you know gets diagnosed with this, take every single pill they give you to make sure that you get this completely out of your system. Fusobacterium has an entirely different um a uh, complication. This is something called Lemire's syndrome. So Lemire's syndrome, uh, your body basically produces a, a pretty strong immune response uh, to the fusobacterium. And the result is you can get these like antibody complexes. We talk about this. I have a video on defects of the immune system. Uh, and one of the things that can happen is you get these uh, antibody antigen complexes that like can clob, uh, like can clog up um, blood vessels and and cause essentially like stroke like symptoms, but fuso can also cause sepsis. So uh, this is also another complication. So, bottom line, if you end up with bacterial pharyngitis, get the proper dose. Get I'm sorry, get the proper diagnosis, get the proper treatment, and follow that treatment regimen all the way to the end. Or you do risk some of these complications even with treatment. Okay, now that I've scared you to death about strep throat, uh, let's move on to something that's something that's probably significantly uh, less terrifying. So let's talk about ear infections. So the proper diagnosis for an ear infection is acute otitis media, which basically means an inflammation of the inner ear. You've got an infection of the uh, of the middle ear or the inner ear. Okay, um, the three most common that we see, the three most common bacteria involved, and it. Really, like any bacteria can cause this if it gets in the right place in abundance. Uh, but the three we most commonly find, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenzae, and Morizella uh, catarrhalis. Okay, these are the three big ones. So strep pneumo is a gram-positive diplococcus. We'll, we'll see this guy again a few more times in this video. Uh, Haemophilus influenzae we'll be seeing again. Uh, that's a gram-negative rod. And then uh, Morizella catarrhalis is a gram-negative diplococcus. And that goes for all Morizellas. If you see them again, they're a gram-negative diplococcus. Caucus, just like Neisseria, by the way, you can keep that in mind uh, if you want to put that in your in your study guide there. Uh, signs and symptoms, pus, redness, and swelling in the ear, and a pretty pronounced earache. Um, nothing shocking here, right? Uh, this is where they take the little thing, and you can see like right in there, this is what a healthy ear looks like, and this is what not a healthy ear looks like right there, right? Uh, transmission, this is going to result from bacteria present in your nasopharynx. So Ear infections are often a secondary infection. You get a cold, you get the flu, you get something else, and all the fluid starts to accumulate. You get stuffed up, you get that congestion. Well, what's happening now are, are these three species are getting pushed elsewhere in your body. They're getting pushed into your sinus cavity. They may get pushed down into your lungs and cause pneumonia, or they get pushed up into your ear. Uh, and now that they're kind of stuck there, they start to, and again, they're not where they're supposed to be, right? So the checks and balances are gone. Their, the, the, their bacteria are no longer in their like healthy, normal location. They're now in a spot where you don't have those cellular defenses. And as a result, they can overgrow. And this is what's going to cause that infection. Diagnosis is clinical signs and symptoms. Uh, you, you take a look here. They put that that little, uh, you know, little. I think it's an otoscope. They put that in there. And they take a look and they see like, yeah, inflammation, swelling, pus, all bad. You have an ear infection. All right. The treatment is going to be antibiotics. Um, so uh, you know, and, and one thing I do want to say about this: you may not always get antibiotics. All right. Um, if the infection is early enough. Caught early enough, antibiotics are going to be infected, going to be effective. But these species are very good at forming biofilms, and if the if the infection has progressed progressed to the point where there is a biofilm, antibiotics not only might not be helpful, they may be harmful in the long run, simply because you're basically throwing these antibiotics against them, encouraging antibiotic resistance with no actual clinical improvement. Um, so. Sometimes, and this has happened to me personally, got an ear infection when I was 30. I don't know who gets an ear infection on their 30th birthday, literally my 30th birthday. Um, I went to the doctor and they're like, yeah, 
here's some pain meds. And I'm like, but I have an infection. So I want antibiotics. And like, it won't do anything. Like you have a brutal ear infection that your body's going to fix on its own. So here are some pain meds. So at least doesn't hurt while your body fixes it. So just be aware of that prevention. So the pneumococcal vaccine can uh, really help your body become resistant to streptococcus pneumoniae. So there is some benefit uh, in terms of preventing ear infections there. Um, and the flu vaccine also helps to, recruit, uh, to reduce the incidence of ear infections. And the major reason behind that is, like I said, this is often a secondary infection. So getting the flu vaccine reduces your risk of developing the flu, or if you do, reduces the severity of the illness, therefore less congestion, therefore less ability for the bacteria to get where it doesn't need to go. All right, diphtheria. So this is a disease that we don't hear about much anymore. And you can thank vaccines for that. Diphtheria is a horrifying disease. And this is a disease that used to wipe out entire like settlements, entire villages. If this showed up on like a ship in the middle of the ocean, it was one of the scariest things that could happen because this is a very deadly disease. Uh, it's caused by a gram-positive rod-shaped bacterium caused, cr called Carinibacterium diphtheriae. So uh, signs and symptoms. Um, the things that are going to stand out to you in the case of diphtheria are this pseudomembrane of dead cells. So this white sort of like it's not pus. This is actually like a membrane of just dead cells that are coating either the nasopharynx or the oropharynx. Um, you can also develop skin lesions, uh, like actual like holes in your skin as a result of this. And then uh, myocarditis. Um, so inflammation of the heart muscles and damage to the heart muscles. Uh, all of these are horrifying consequences that can be potentially fatal. Diphtheria spreads fairly readily through respiratory droplets and aerosols. Again, this is one of those things like if it showed up, holy cow. The diagnosis is based on clinical signs and symptoms. Uh, there really aren't any tests available for this. I mean, uh, we don't see diphtheria much, thank goodness. Uh, and the treatment for this is antibiotics. Um, the prevention for this and the reason why we don't see this, the reason we don't see this, and I'm going to keep hammering this in all of my videos about this is there is a vaccine. So the normally people get the DTaP vaccine, which is diphtheria, tetanus, and acellular pertussis. You get a series of these, uh, shortly after you're born, you get these sort of as part of your, your childhood vaccination, um, schedule. Uh, but you can also get re-upped on just a diphtheria and tetanus vaccine. So the DT vaccine to get yourself, uh, caught up. Okay. Uh, complications associated with this death, like this is a gruesome death, um, not fun. Um, and, um, you know, again, I, I, I do worry that with all, all the anti-vax stuff that goes around that we're living in a role where this stuff might start to come back. I hope I'm wrong, but this is not something we want to see again. Okay, uh, moving on to a disease that is, um, it's a little bit different, right? So when we talk about a lot of diseases, we're like, here's the disease, here's what causes it, here's this. Pneumonia is a little bit different in that its diagnosis is really based on one symptom alone, one finding, and that's fluid in the lungs. That's what pneumonia is. So uh, the, the way we diagnose this clinically we, we, we do an x-ray, we do a chest x-ray and we look for fluid buildup in the lungs. The problem when we talk about diagnosing this, more importantly, treating it, is there are in, in, in just an incredible number of things that can cause pneumonia. Um, streptococcus pneumoniae, obviously it's named for it, right? We just saw a, a few minutes ago that it's also responsible for ear infections and we'll learn at some point that it's responsible for some cases of meningitis and it can cause all kinds of things. So strep pneumo, um, this is the most common way to get pneumonia from a, what we call CA or community acquired pneumonia. So if you get pneumonia as a result of being infected by something in the community, it's probably going to be strep pneumo. Uh, in the elderly, though, we often see Haemophilus influenzae as the result, as the causative agent here. Now, you may have also heard somebody refer to, oh, I had walking pneumonia. This is mycoplasma-based pneumonia. So mycoplasma pneumoniae causes this. Um, it can be caused by uh, chlamydia. So chlamydia trachomatis, which does cause chlamydia, can also end up in the lungs and cause pneumonia, as well as some closely related species, Chlamydophila pneumoniae and Chlamydophila cetacei. Uh, uh, sorry, I mispronounced that. Uh, can also cause 
pneumonia. Um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we met this in a previous video. We talked about it in terms of uh, being able to infect the eyes and the skin. Uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae and Staphylococcus aureus are often acquired in a healthcare setting. So um, we, this is something that we really worry about in terms of those HAIs, those healthcare associated infections, also known as nosocomial infections. People sit in the hospital for weeks and then it's only a matter of time. They're in a weakened state. They might be being treated for drugs. They might be post-surgery. They might be something. Their defenses are down and all of a sudden clubs yell and ammonia walks in, Staphylococcus aureus walks in, they get it in their lungs and now they develop some type of hospital acquired pneumonia. Um, I've listed the, the descriptions of the causative agents here. Strep pneumo is a gram positive diplococcus, hemophilus influenza is a gram negative rod. Mycoplasma is one of those small um, cell wallless bacteria. Uh, the chlam chlamydophila and the chlamydias, those are gram-negative intracellular bacteria. Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Klebsiella pneumoniae are gram-negative rods, and Staph aureus is a gram-positive Staphylococcus. Signs and symptoms, fluid in the lungs, difficulty breathing, chest pain. Uh, there is one uh, unique symptom that I came across when I was researching for this. Klebsiella pneumoniae actually produces something called current jelly sput sputum. Uh, so currants are like a fruit. Uh, you can get currant jelly. It's this sort of like red, purplish mucus that people spit up uh, when they have uh, Klebsiella pneumonia based um, uh, uh, pneumonia. And it's really a combination of blood, mucus, and just other like cellular debris. It's really not good. So transmission, it's going to vary. It's going to vary based on um, which type of pneumonia you acquired. And this could also be a clue to what type you're dealing with if you encounter this in a clinical setting. So strep pneumo is part of your normal, your normal microbiota. You have this in you, about a third of the population, I believe, has strep pneumo in them. Um, it's just a matter of, does it make it into the wrong place at the wrong, at the wrong time, right? Maybe you have a cold, maybe you have a flu. Just like we talk about ear, for ear infections, instead of going into your ears, it went down into your lungs. Uh, Haemophilus influenzae, um, mycoplasma pneumoniae, um, uh, chlamydophila pneumoniae. Um, those are going to become from, uh, droplets, um, and aerosols. So you're going to inhale those, uh, uh, chlamydophila cetacei, that's going to come from domestic birds actually. So if you're somebody who owns birds, um, or, you know, maybe you work with birds for some reason, you could be a, a farmer's. Uh, if you if you have like a, an egg farm, if you have chickens, this is something that you can actually get. So like important information to tell the doctor, right? If you have to go to the hospital, hey, by the way, I own like four parrots. Like that's important for me. By the way, I, I work on a, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a chicken farmer. I've got chickens. Important thing to know, right? Uh, chlamydia trachomatis. Uh, the way we usually see this is the mother has an STI, the baby gets it through vertical transmission. That's the most common way to get chlamydia trachomatis uh, based pneumonia. Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Klebsiella pneumonia, those uh, and Staph aureus usually come from a medical device. So if you're somebody that's um, dealing with a patient who is on a ventilator or is, uh, you know, always has like nasal cannula, oxygen mask on. Boom, this is where you should be looking. These are three that can easily come from that. If you're a respiratory therapist or going into respiratory therapy, these are the ones that you should be thinking a lot about if your patient develops pneumonia and they're on one of these breathing machines. Diagnosis, clinical signs and symptoms, usually followed up with a chest x-ray to figure that out. And then you are probably gonna do some sputum cultures because you wanna know what it is that you're dealing with because as we just described, um, there's a wide array of bacteria that can be causing this and the treatments are going to vary. The treatment's going to be antibiotics in all cases, but which antibiotic matters, right? So, you know, I'm just giving you antibiotics broadly, let the doctors handle that. Um, but this is one of those where we kind of want to know what it is because that's going to inform us. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, for example, resistant to a lot of different antibiotics. So you're not going to treat that the same way as you would if somebody has just, you know, pneumococcal based pneumonia. Uh, prevention. So the pneumococcal vaccine helps uh, because it's going to prevent, it's going to help your body fight off that infection. Um, the one thing I will note is people might be thinking, well, there is the Hib vaccine that prevents against Haemophilus influenzae. Um, that actually only works for the encapsulated strains. Okay. So there's a couple of different serovars um, for, uh, or strains, if you will, of Haemophilus influenzae. Some are encapsulated, some aren't. The vaccine is specifically for the encapsulated version. These don't cause pneumonia, whereas the, the non-encapsulated strains do. 
still isn't going to help in this case. Complications uh, all have the capability of being fatal. People probably don't realize this, but pneumonia is actually the number one cause of death, I believe, of infectious disease it's because so many infections eventually work their way out into pneumonia at some point. And it's fatal because when you can't breathe, you die. Um, Klebsiella pneumoniae and uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. I apologize. This should have an E on the end. I've seen this a couple times with Klebsiella. I think I think when I entered these in, there was like a spell check thing that was like, that's not how you spell pneumonia. That's because I'm spelling a species name. Uh, these two species of infections are often drug resistant and have very high mortality rates. Just because we don't have a drug that can effectively treat them, by the time we figure out what it is, we're too far gone. Remember, these are ones that are spread through breathing machines. These are people who already aren't breathing on their own or their breathing isn't sufficient. So now you add this on top of that, it's not much you can do. Okay, so tuberculosis, staying down there in the lower respiratory tract, speaking about the lungs. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is an acid fast rod. Um, the reason we call it that is gram staining is ineffective. These myco, oh my goodness, there's another typo right there. Uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, MYCO uh, bacterium tuberculosis uh, is an acid fast rod. It has that uh, layer of mycolic acid on the outside of the cell. It's an abnormal cell wall. This just keeps things out. Like it's very good at keeping antibiotics and drugs out, which is why treating it is so challenging. Um, the other thing about this is while it's keeping antibiotics and other harmful things out, um, it's also doing a pretty good job of um, keeping nutrients out for the cell. Mycobacteria grow very, very slowly. And we'll encounter at another time, uh, mycobacterium lepri, which causes leprosy, another incredibly slowly progressing disease. And tuberculosis is one of those. And if you've read things, uh, if you've read things about tuberculosis, this was a disease that was just a widespread killer for a very long time, starting in really in the late eight, late 18th century, moving into the early part of the 19th century. You can find all across the United States uh, places where people who had tuberculosis, which was also known as the consumption, um, where they would go to essentially die. Um, you know, they would send them to these mountain retreats where the cool, fresh air was supposed to help, but there were no ventilators back then. There were no antibiotics back then. They had no idea how to treat mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. So people would just slowly waste away or be consumed, hence the consumption over years and years and years. So fortunately, we live in the modern era where we can treat this for the most part. So signs and symptoms, coughing, chest pain, and bloody sputum. Um, the transmission is through respiratory droplets and aerosols, which is why it spreads so readily, particularly in unprotected communities like cities, big cities and places like that. Diagnosis is going to be a chest x-ray. You're looking for the lesions that are caused by, to, by, by the bacterium. Basically, what happens is your body can't process. It can't rid itself of the mycobacterium because of that stupid cell wall. So the result is your body just sort of cordons them off into these caseous lesions. They basically calcify them and then just go, all right, you're here. And when you look at the patient's chest x-ray, you're going to see these these granulomas that are built up in their lungs, which is where they've just been shelled off. You can see this is what's actually go going on right here um, in these in these images here. You can see it, it infects it, and then it kind of gets walled off. But the problem is this is dead tissue. So over time, more and more of your lung begins to look like these little these lesions, these granulomas, and that's less and less surface area for you to breathe. And eventually you just kind of die as a result of this. It's really a slow, painful, scary death. Um, treatment is antibiotics, but they are specialized antibiotics. We're looking at things like isoniazid and things like that. And be aware that the treatment regimen lasts between 12 and 18 months, uh, because it takes a long time to get rid of these, uh, get rid of all of this. Now there is actually a vaccination for this. And many people who live in the United States might not be aware. It's called the BCG vaccine. We only give this to people who we consider to be at risk, uh, of getting it. But in other countries where, tuberculosis is still fairly common, um, they get this as a part of their normal vaccine regimen. The thing here is in the United States, tuberculosis is almost non-existent. We rarely see cases of it. Um, and because the rate is so low, it's one of those where the vaccine would just be worthless. It just wouldn't help. It's just one more vaccine that we don't need. And that's why when people say like, oh, they give us all the vaccines, we don't actually get all the vaccines. There are vaccines that we do not get because it's not a problem in our country. Complications, death, and then dissemination. So dissemination is, just to be clear, dissemination is never a good word unless we're talking about knowledge. Disseminating knowledge, which I'm doing today, is great, but a disseminating disease, 
bad. If this gets out of the lungs and into other parts of the body, that's it. There's there, that's it. Like there's really you're looking at death, even in the case of treatment in many cases. Okay. Now that I've scared you with tuberculosis, let's go to something that's slightly less scary. Pertussis. This is more commonly known as uh, whooping cough. Um, and that's because of the pronounced whooping sound that happens uh, during the bouts of coughing. Um, it's caused by a gram-negative rod called Bordetella pertussis. Um, and what you'll get is a prolonged period of severe coughing, that whooping sound. So the early stages are called the catarrhal stages. These are mild and unremarkable. One thing you may notice is the you're and I'm going to refer to children because we typically see the signs and symptoms more pronounced in children, uh, like a pronounced runny nose, um, and then just general like ill. But then the thing that's going to give it away is the paroxysmal, the paroxysmal stage, which is uncontrollable coughing spasms, and this is the result of mucus accumulation. And this is where they start giving that <laughs> sound as they try to work that up, and you're going to hear that sound, um, and this can last for weeks. Um, and it's it's really bad. Like you you can see down here in the complications, the coughing can be so pronounced and so like just these bouts can last for so long. Vomiting can happen and rib fractures can happen. It's not uncommon for people to break their ribs from coughing so hard as a result of this. Um, and in severe cases in infants, this can be fatal because of the amount of, of accumulation of this sort of stuff. Transmission is through respiratory droplets and aerosols. Um, early on, you can do a bacterial culture, so you can swab like the nose uh, and the throat to get a bacterial culture and grow this. But later on, PCR and ELISA will be the definitive diagnosis. Um, but if you've got somebody that's making that coughing sound, that's about it. Treatments, antibiotics. Now, this is something that we can prevent. So this is where the DTaP vaccine again comes into play: diphtheria, tetanus, and a cellular pertussis. So uh, in one of my videos, I talk about the different types of vaccinations. This is one of those that's just like the bits and pieces. It's a subunit vaccine, so it's not infectious at all. Um, but it gives the body the ability to recognize this bacterium when it shows up. Uh, one thing you may actually have happen to you, um, if you are an expecting parent, mother or father, um, they're going to check your DTAP status. They, they're going to want to check your status because what they like to do is re-up this vaccine um, at some point prior to the arrival of the child. Because like I said, infants, they haven't had their full vaccination series yet. They can't. So what do we do? We protect mom and dad because that's the most likely, those are the most likely people that are going to spread this to their child. So we try to make sure that the parents are vaccinated so that they're not going to develop or at least even carry this bacterium around with them, reducing the risk of spreading it to their baby. Okay, Legionnaire's disease. Uh, so this one is another uh, not so fun illness that people can get. So uh, Legionnaire's disease is caused by a gram-negative rod called Legionella, Legionella uh, pneumophila. Um, and as you can anticipate from the name, this is another lung-based infection, excuse me, lung-based infection, but it's not restricted to the lung. So the earliest signs and symptoms are going to be the appearance of pneumonia. And this could be fairly mild. This could be just, you know, sort of the chest pain, difficulty breathing, or it could be incredibly severe. And oftentimes what gets people into the hospital is like they pass out, they faint, they flash, something happens and they end up getting taken into the hospital with severe pneumonia. You may also see signs like fever, nausea, vomiting, and then neurological symptoms like confusion and uh, loss of, 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 of place and time, that kind of stuff. Um, this is actually transmitted through aerosols from human-made sources, okay? This usually isn't spread from person to person. Instead, you can get it from shower heads. You can get it from sprinkler systems. You can get it from water fountains. You can get it from like the cool fountains you see in hotel lobbies. You can get it from places like that. And then it gets in and it gets into your lungs. This is an incredibly severe form of pneumonia that the pneumonia alone can kill you. Uh, the problem is, is Legionella pneumophila quite often makes it out of the lungs and begins to disseminate. There's that word again, right? Disseminate. Disseminate is not a good thing. So early on, we're going to diagnose with bacterial cultures, um, but in certain stereotypes, we can actually detect it with a rapid urine test. Treatment of, is, of course, um, with antibiotics, but even with that, 10% of cases are actually fatal. The problem, again, is that this can make it out of the lungs. And once it disseminates, now we're looking at a situation where sepsis is going to start to get involved. And one of the complications I don't actually have listed here is the sep because it's kind of downstream of the sepsis. 
when you go into um, bacterial sepsis, your blood pressure tanks, your, um, you know, you're going to start losing blood flow out to the digits. So the way they fix that is actually by using something called pressors. They squeeze your capillaries so that it brings your blood pressure up. The problem is, is that's going to boost the core. It's going to hurt out here on your fingertips. It's going to hurt in your toes. And quite often people lose fingers, whole hands, um, whole feet, toes, that sort of stuff, because those are going to get necrotic. They're going to uh, die <laughs> um, because they've got to keep your core blood pressure up and it's going to come at the expense of these guys. So loss of digits and stuff, loss of limbs are possible um, or acute kidney failure. And this is something that, you know, you know, do you die of Legionnaire's disease? No. Do you die of kidney failure a few years down the road? Yeah. Right. So those are the complications associated with that. So Legionnaire's not very good. Okay, and the last of the bacterial infections we're going to talk about is something called Q fever. Uh, so Q fever um, is spread by an intracellular gram-negative bacterium known as Coxiella burnettii. Uh, symptoms include high fever, headache, coughing, and pneumonia. Um, and the natural mode of transmission um, is typically through uh, exposure to livestock. You're going to get this by being exposed to infected sheep, cattle, horses, uh, things like that. It is also possible that you can get it through tick exposure. That's rare. It would have had to have had a blood meal from an infected live, uh, you know, livestock and then go to you, uh, that kind of stuff. But you can also get it through unpasteurized milk. If you touch amniotic fluid or urine from an infected animal, that's possible too. This is also something that has been recently brought up as a potential bioterrorist uh, weapon, although there have never been a case. I don't think, as far as I know, there's no documented case of it actually being used. It's just one of those bacteria that seems particularly amenable to its use. Uh, diagnosis, uh, we're going to use PCR, which is testing for DNA, or ELISA, which tests for antibodies to do that. And treatment is going to be antibiotics. Um, the complications, in rare cases, it does become chronic, and that will lead to endocarditis, which is potentially fatal. Okay, switching gears, uh, we're going to switch to viral infections of the respiratory tract. And the first one we're going to talk about is the one that's probably on everybody's mind all the time now because we survived a pandemic. Uh, that's something you're going to get to tell everybody in your life at some point is, I survived a pandemic, which is something that I did not have on my bucket list uh, for my lifetime. Uh, causative agent, SARS-CoV-2 virus is what its technical name is. Um, signs and symptoms, there are a lot of them. And again, you're going to get a lot from me here because this is one of the best studied diseases we have in recent history. Fever and or chills, cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. You may have a sore throat, congestion or runny nose. All these things just sound like the cold or the flu, which is, again, what made the pandemic so hard. Um, but here's something that you, that's unique, loss of taste and or smell. Fatigue is common, muscle and body aches, headache. And then one of the things that we actually did see that sort of differentiated this disease between children and adults, a lot of kids got nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Most adults didn't. So transmission, respiratory droplets and aerosols, also direct contact. So those of us who are cleaning our, our groceries when we brought them home, we weren't entirely wrong. Uh, diagnosis, so the lab test is via PCR, although we now have a slew of widely available antigen tests at home. This is your confirmation. So if you test positive for this and need confirmation, it's the PCR lab test that'll do it. Treatment, uh, if it's mild, symptomatic. If it's mild or severe, but we're uh, but in the case of mild, for people who have um, immunocompromised conditions, they're going to get antivirals. There's a, a bunch of those out there now. If it's a severe case and you're hospitalized, convalescent plasma can still be used. Mechanical ventilation, you might be on a breathing machine. And again, this is one of the things that I just reiterate to people uh, about, uh, about COVID. And I, I get that so many people think that the way we handled the pandemic was just so overblown. But I just, I need to stress to people how crazy this was, how unique of a situation this was. And you're right, for like 99% of the population, this was not something that was going to result in death. It was not something that was going to result in hospitalization. It was not going to result in something that needed mechanical ventilation. But it's a numbers game. So let's say that's 1% of the United States population. That's still 3.5 million people. 
we don't have that many hospital beds in the United States, and we certainly don't have enough ventilators. And the big fear was that the entire population was going to get sick all in a very short time window. And if that happens, and 1% of our population needs to go to a hospital, we don't have that capacity. No hospital. It would crush. It would crash the U.S. hospital system. And we saw, even with the measures put in place, how overrun hospitals were. And if you don't understand that, go talk to somebody who was working in a hospital at the time. Go talk to one of those nurses. Go talk to those doctors. Go talk to the people that helped out. Um, and that was the big thing. Yeah, that's why we were so restrictive. We didn't know what COVID-19 was going to do to us. We didn't know how to prevent it. We didn't know how to treat it. And we didn't. And what we did know, we did know was that we didn't have the capacity to have an entire United States population get this illness and keep people alive. Prevention, there are lots of COVID vaccines available. I'm not going to go through them all at once. But I will take a brief second to talk a bit about the mRNA vaccine. Go and watch my video on that. Please go and watch my video on the mRNA vaccine. To this day, almost five years later, I still hear people uh, spouting nonsense about how the mRNA vaccine worked. I need to stress over and over again, the mRNA vaccination was the holy grail of vaccinations. And the fact that we were able to get that accomplished in less than a year is, I, I think when people look back at this in decades, decades from now and look back, they're going to view that as one of the single greatest accomplishments that we were able to do in the middle of a pandemic, develop an entirely new vaccine on an entirely new platform that was just being researched to get that done and make that available worldwide. That that is, I cannot understate what a remarkable accomplishment that was. And before you, like you may be a very well-educated person and still have misinformation about the mRNA vaccine, please go watch my video on the mRNA vaccine. Go watch my video on vaccinations um, and learn about it. Learn about it. There are a lot of misconceptions out there. Um, complications, it can be fatal, particularly in people with pre-existing conditions. I think we're all aware of that. And it can become chronic. I think every one of us probably knows somebody who's experiencing long COVID. The fact that they'll never get rid of the damage that was done to their body as a result of that infection. Prior to COVID-19, the virus that we were probably most concerned with was the influenza virus, particularly the influenza A virus. So there are three different types of influenza viruses, influenza A, influenza B, and influenza C. For the most part, it's influenza a that we're most worried about, but in recent years, we've actually seen the influenza B vaccine. Uh, I'm sorry, the influenza B virus, not vaccine, the influenza B virus um, become more problematic in some years. Um, so one of the things that we need to do that we really need to worry about when it comes to um, the flu is distinguishing whether somebody has a cold or whether somebody has a flu. And there are a couple of, of key things we want to look at symptomatically. So the first is a fever. People with the flu tend to have a fairly high fever. They're in the 102s and the 103s. People with a cold, if you get a fever at all, it's less, it's like 100. Usually you don't. While both often commonly cause headaches, um, when we talk about those body aches and pains, that's the flu. If you've got body aches and pains, you probably don't have a cold. If you do, they're going to be mild and they'll be gone within a day. If you have aches and pains and they're severe and they last for more than a day, probably the flu. Same thing with the fatigue. Usually with a cold, you can function with a cold, right? Like you might still go to work. You 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 know, you're you're not going to just like wall yourself off. With the flu, you're dead out. You're on the couch, you're sleeping, you're laying in bed, you know, that kind of stuff. Again, when it comes to nasal congestion and sneezing, that's not going to happen with the flu. That's going to happen with a cold. So if you're sneezing and wheezing and that kind of stuff, and you don't have a fever, and you don't have severe body aches, it's probably a cold. If you're, sne if you're not sneezing, you don't have nasal congestion, but you've got the aches and the pains and the headache and all that kind of stuff, now you got the flu, especially with that fever. Um, when it comes to the different types of viruses, uh, influenza A is the one we typically worry about because this one actually is present in animal reservoirs. Influenza B and influenza C tend to be human. Um, and influenza A is really the only of the three that can cause pandemic levels of infection uh, and also experiences that antigenic shift that I've talked about in, in a previous video. We don't see that with the B and C viruses because they don't have those animal hosts to, to have it happen. Uh, in terms of transmission, this is coming through respiratory droplets and aerosols, but be aware of direct contact, right? Somebody sneezes, leaves their 
goo, their body secretions on the table and you touch it, you can still get it. Diagnosis is clinical signs and symptoms, although there is a rapid test out there. Uh, they may want to test you because they're trying to figure out what's going around. We build the flu vaccine every year. And yes, there is a vaccine and there are many flu vaccines. We build the flu vaccines off of what was most common in the year before. So you may hear that it's quadrivalent, trivalent, divalent. That's how many strains of the flu they're protecting you against. Okay. Um, and there are different types of them. Uh, treat, um, in terms of treatment, Usually it's symptomatic. If you're a, a normal sort of healthy person with no real sort of like uh, health concerns or pre-existing conditions, you're going to feel miserable for three to five days and then you'll eventually recover. But if we're looking at people who are potentially at risk of, of severe infection, um, we may prescribe something like Tamiflu. One of the things I want you to, people to be aware about, people think that like you get the flu, you take Tamiflu, you're good. Tamiflu is really only effective in the first like 24 hours or so after you, after you develop signs and symptoms. If you don't do it quick, it's not going to work. Uh, complications, this can be fatal. Tens of thousands of people die every year in the United States alone uh, from the flu. Uh, they're usually people that are on either end of the age spectrum, very young, very old, uh, or people who have pre-existing conditions. But um, you know, last, I want to say it was last year. So I'm recording this, this is 2024, uh, the flu in 2023 overlapping into early 2024. Uh, we had people that were like, you know, young adults, very healthy dying of influenza B. That was a weird one. Uh, we did not expect that. I mean, it wasn't like epidemic levels, but, uh, it was, there were, there were deaths of people that you would not typically associate with flu related deaths. So it can't happen. So take it seriously. Uh, there's also something called Rye syndrome. Uh, this is swelling of the liver uh, in the brain. Um, and this occurs mainly in children. We discovered that, and if you look at, by the way, um, this usually involves aspirin. Okay. If you look at aspirin bottles, they will say right on them, please do not get children under the age of 12. Uh, and this is because there was sort of like a, a rash of this that happened um, in like the 60s, 70s. And by the time we got to the 80s, we had pinpointed and said, we shouldn't be giving children aspirin uh, for things like that. Okay, uh, RSV. So RSV also is is technically called the respiratory syncytial virus. It's just a hard word to say. So we've obviously abbreviated it to RSV, um, and this is uh, something that we worry about in particular with infants and the elderly. So signs and symptoms of this are shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, pneumonia, and cold like symptoms. So this is one of those things where like in adults, if you get RSV, like if you're just like uh, uh, you know. A, let's just say parenting age, right? Like you're in your thirties, your forties, late twenties, whatever it happens to be. And you get this and you're a normal, healthy adult. You're going to think I have a cold because you're going to have all the cold like symptoms, right? I'm stuffy. I have a runny nose. I'm like, Bleh, and this stinks. But if it's RSV, you can readily spread, spread that to infants and the elderly whose body isn't as robust as yours, doesn't have the immunocompetence know, that your body has. And then they end up developing significantly worse signs and symptoms. Um, and you spread this through respiratory droplets and aerosols or direct contact. Diagnosis is through clinical signs and symptoms. And if it's mild, even, even if it's mild, young children may still be hospitalized as a result because what can happen is it gets more and more severe. Basically, you get inflammation and mucus accumulation inside the breathing passages. And because in children and infants, those breathing passages are so small, they can almost close entirely. And at that case, you're going to need mechanical ventilation. You're going to need to, your child may actually be on a respirator uh, for days or weeks until your body can, their body can rid itself. Um, and it can be fatal. So uh, it turns out that there's now an RSV vaccine. There wasn't one up until very recently. I, I want to say it came out, the vaccines that we're seeing came out. Uh, again, this is 2024, but I want to say that the, the vaccines that came out, I want to say came out in like 2022. They're fairly recent. Um, and now they're recommending them. There is one uh, vaccine for people who are 60 plus. So people who are in that risk category. And there are two out there for infants uh, to get. So uh, please get your child vaccinated for this. This is something that really only is problematic for them. Uh, if you're a normal functioning adult, you're fine. And if you have a parent or a loved one, a grandparent who's 60 plus, talk to them about getting the RSV vaccine. It could save their life. All right. Um, measles. So uh, this is one that I actually used to tell my students, like, you'll probably never see this. And then the anti-vax movement has gotten more widespread and we're actually seeing outbreaks of measles 
in particular in places where the anti-vax movement is effective. Uh, we've seen them in Florida. We've seen it in New York City. We've seen it in Southern California uh, just in the past five or six years. Um, and I need to stress this. Measles is not a minor infection. It can cause long-term damage and is fatal. The signs and symptoms include a very high fever, conjunctivitis, sore throat. The dead giveaway symptoms are going to be this measles rash. This is a very unique rash. And these things called coplex spots. These occur, they're white spots inside the cheeks. Um, you may, if, I don't know, if you're old like me, you may remember Bugs Bunny. Um, cartoons where if he was ill, he'd like check his mouth for spots. This is one of the things he was looking for. He wanted to find out whether he was going to die of measles, um, which is like really dark when you think about it, but it's it's real. Um, transmission is through respiratory droplets and aerosols as well as direct contact. And I cannot stress this enough. Measles is one of the most contagious diseases we know of. It spreads very quickly, very easily. And those who are exposed pretty much are guaranteed to get infected unless they've been vaccinated. Diagnosis is through clinical signs and symptoms. And unfortunately, there's no treatment for measles. It's symptomatic, which means if you get it, you're kind of at the mercy of the disease. Hopefully your body fights it off well, but if not, you might develop pneumonia. You can develop encephalitis, which can cause permanent brain damage and death. Um, treatment, symptomatic comfort only. How do you prevent this? The MMR vaccine. It's one of the safest vaccines on the market. It has been used for decades um, and it can prevent this potentially fatal, severe illness um, that impacts children. Rubella, also known as German measles. And you can see what we don't like to refer to as German measles is too close to something that's very serious. Um, rubella isn't overly bad, but it can be for a certain segment of the population, which we'll talk about in a minute. It's caused by the rubella virus. 50% of the people who get it are asymptomatic. Those who do get it get a rash. Now, clinically, this is a different rash than measles, but there are times where people feel the need to actually do some follow-up tests to confirm that it is, in fact, rubella as opposed to measles. Uh, transmission, respiratory droplets and aerosols. We diagnose this through clinical signs and symptoms. Uh, again, you should be able to recognize that this rash is different than the measles rash, but if you're not sure, you can always go back in and, and check um, through some confirmatory tests. Uh, treatment, symptomatic, comfort only, prevention, measles, mumps, and rubella. So we're preventing both of these diseases with the same exact vaccine. Here's why we're concerned about it. This is what's known as a teratogenic virus, a disease that can impact the developing fetus. Teratogens are things that can alter the development process of a fetus. This can result, if the mother who is pregnant gets infected, this can result in stillbirth. It can result in spontaneous abortion, also known as a miscarriage, or in congenital birth defects. This is particularly more common if mom is infected during the first and second trimesters. You can end up with physical or mental abnormalities as a result. Quite often, this is why, again, moms who get pregnant, uh, women who are thinking about getting pregnant, you should get your MMR re-upped. This is not something that you want to accidentally acquire uh, during the gestation process. Chicken pox and shingles. Uh, chicken pox for all of us, shingles for the old people in us. Uh, causative agent is the varicella zoster virus. That's the technical name. Uh, and signs and symptoms is a rash, super itchy rash, fever and chills. And then in adults, you can actually develop pneumonia. So let's talk about chicken pox and let's talk about why most people nowadays don't get it and why the rest of us who did get it are worried. Chicken pox was a disease and it's one of those diseases. And I allude to this in some of my other videos. There are certain diseases you want to get when you're younger versus when you are older. And that is because in children, chicken pox almost universally results in a rash that's itchy and obnoxious that lasts for a few days to a week and then resolves spontaneously on its own. And then you end up with lifelong immunity to chicken pox. In adults, it's much more severe. In particular, it seems to cause pneumonia, which can be potentially fatal. And given that there's no treatment for chicken pox, you just have to hope that pneumonia doesn't kill you, okay? So with this in mind, my generation and generations before me had chicken pox parties, which meant that 
your friend, Billy down the street, he would get chicken pox. And then your mom would find out and be like, hey, did you hear Billy stayed home from school today? He has chicken. Why don't you go down there and why don't you go uh, and make him feel better? You know, make sure you share his cup and make sure, you know, you, you, you talk real close with him. Give him a hug. Tell him you're rooting for him. Why? Because your mom and dad wanted you to get chicken pox and they weren't doing it to be destructive or mean. They just knew like this is sort of like a natural vaccination, right? You get this, you're going to be itchy and scratchy. You're going to be a pain to deal with for three or three to five days. And then you won't have to worry about getting it later in life. But most parents also didn't realize that there's a complication associated with that. And that's that the varicella zoster virus, like other herpes viruses, can reactivate and cause shingles. I still have the chicken pox virus inside of me. It didn't go away. It's just been hanging out since I had it when I was, I believe I was in first grade. I almost, I vividly remember hanging out in the basement. It was sometime in the fall uh, when I had it and I spent the entire time with gloves on so I didn't scratch myself into oblivion. Uh, did my schoolwork at home, ate a lot of chicken soup. Um, but that means that this is sort of hiding inside of me like a time bomb waiting to reactivate. And the result is the shingles, uh, or not the shingles, shingles, uh, which is the reactivation. And some people may never get shingles. We may never develop it. I've never had it. You know, uh, hopefully I won't. Um, and other people, they can develop shingles as early as like their twenties. Some people even get it in their teens and it just comes back. I had a, a kid on my baseball team when I was in college, he got shingles at 18. Uh, and it was just lost the whole season because it's miserable. It hurts. It burns excuse me, it's painful. Just go watch the TV ads. So there is actually now a shingles vaccine out there for people who either chronically get shingles, or I think there's a, an age on uh, a blanket. I want to say it's like 55. You have to be at least 55 to get it. I think they've recently lowered it. It used to be in the sixties. They've lowered, they've lowered it now. Um, but those of you who are younger than me, you Gen Z and, 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 uh, you know, younger millennial types, you got the vaccine. That means that you got vaccinated against chicken pox, which means you have the lifelong immunity that I have without ever having to get chicken pox and you can't get shingles from it. So good for you. Uh, and get your kids vaccinated against chicken pox so they don't have to go through the same stuff that I went through. All right. All right. Let's uh, move on to fungal infections of the respiratory tract. First one's histoplasmosis. This is caused by a dimorphic fungus called histoplasma capsulatum. So uh, you can see this here. This is what a, this is what a lung biopsy looks like. Actually, this is what the fungal culture is going to look like in someone that has that. All right, this is what it looks like in the wild. Um, signs and symptoms: fever, headache, dry cough, weakness, chest discomfort. Right. Um, the way you get this is by inhaling the spores uh, from the soil. Typically, histoplasmosis is going to result in inhaling these spores from either bird or bat droppings. They love that. So again, if you're an individual who finds themselves around a lot of bird droppings, um, maybe you raise pigeons, maybe you have birds like parakeets and parrots, maybe you're a chicken farmer, you are at risk for this. What's interesting is a lot, of, we're all, this is around, right? You are probably exposed to histoplasma capsulatum at some point in your life, but you don't develop any symptoms of an infection. What we do have to worry about, again, is dissemination. Um, if you do end up with, with this type of, uh, of infection, your body usually rids itself. Uh, you're exposed to it. You don't develop anything at all. But if it starts to disseminate, you're going to need uh, antifungals. And, of course, if it disseminates, that makes it much harder to get rid of. Could potentially become chronic. You could end up with this fungi, live, this fungus living in you for the rest of your life. You'd have to be on antifungals. Um, and in rare cases, it could actually be fatal. Here's one that's fun to say. Uh, coccidioidomycosis. So that's how we're going to say that word. <laughs> There's a reason people call this valley fever. <laughs> uh, so coccidioides imitis is the major causative agent for this. Is again a dimorphic fungus. It grows in the wild. It's sort of a mold, but when you inhale it, you get these uh, these cysts that grow in your lungs uh, it grows as like a yeast in there fever headache cough night sweats you might get a red spotty rash joint and muscle aches um again you're getting this uh from inhalation of coccidioides uh imitus spores from the soil 
This is everywhere, by the way. Any place where you're going to sound like fine sandy, silty soil, you might find this particular uh, fungus. And we inhale it on a regular basis, but only in some cases do we find people developing signs or symptoms. Uh, this is mostly going to impact the lungs. You'll do fungal cultures and you'll find stuff like this. And so that what you see there in green, that's actually... Um, been tagged with the fluorescent antibody. That's why it's glowing bright green like that. It's not actually uh, bright green, but that would be super cool if it was. Um, the treatment here is symptomatic in most cases, but again, if it disseminates antifungals. Uh, and dissemination can lead to meningitis. Uh, it will, I'll have another video when we talk about diseases of the nervous system and fungal meningitis is real. Uh, and coccidioides imidis is one of those causative agents. And you may actually develop skin lesions. You can actually see that on this person here. He's developed skin lesions as a result of... Uh, that particular infection. Blastomycosis uh, is a fungal infection caused by Blastomyces dermatitidis. Uh, it is a dimorphic fungus. It looks like this when it grows inside of you. It looks like a mold out in the wild. Um, and usually if you get signs and symptoms, we're looking at mild flu-like symptoms, but if you're immunocompromised, you can get skin lesions that look like this. And this is pretty grotesque. Uh, again, inhalation of spores from the soil. Uh, fungal culture is usually from sputum, just like the other two, or antigen tests uh, to detect this. Treatment is antifungals only if dissemination occurs. Um, and yeah, that's what we're looking at here. Got out of the lungs and now it's in the skin and causing that sort of stuff. Uh, pneumocystis pneumonia, uh, sorry, pneumonia, there I said pneumonia, I put the E on the end, uh, pneumocystis pneumonia, uh, this is a, ca the causative agent of this is something called pneumocystis gyrovecchiae, uh, and, and that is, uh, another fungus, not dimorphic, just a, a regular old fungus. This is a type of pneumonia that we almost exclusively see in patients with AIDS. In fact, this is considered to be an AIDS-defining illness. If you were HIV positive and then develop pneumocystis pneumonia, you are now considered to have transitioned from being HIV positive to having AIDS. Uh, we may also see this in infants or other immunocompromised in individuals. So this could be somebody with another type of um, immuno, uh, um, immuno incompetence, so a, a hyposensitivity, if you will. Um, or immunodeficiency, um, or somebody that's an infant or very old, okay? Uh, fever, cough, shortness of breath, just like standard pneumonia. Uh, you get this by being transmitted through respiratory droplets and aerosols, uh, and then doing PCR or microscopy can allow you to see these. Treatments are antibiotics. If this isn't treated, it's going to be fatal. Again, this is almost exclusively happening in people who are immunocompromised. If you don't treat this, this will just take over their body and kill them. And the last one, we've made it to the end. Cryptococco, cryptococcosis, okay? So cryptococcosis is caused by Cryptococcus neoformans. Uh, that is another fungus. Uh, you can see it here. This is what the cells look like. The budding cell, this is what it's going to look like when it's inside the body. Fever, fatigue, dry cough. This is another one of those. Cryptococcus is everywhere. I guarantee you've been exposed to cryptococcus um, and you've inhaled the spores, but in rare condition, in rare people, it can cause an actual infection. It will cause this sort of lung infection. Treatment is going to be with antifungals. Uh, the problem is, is you're probably immunocompromised if you develop signs and symptoms. And in those people, it can disseminate to the brain. And in that case, it's probably going to be fatal. Uh, also, if it doesn't spread to the brain in immunocompromised individuals, lifelong antifungal therapy. And as you probably recall from my previous videos, antifungal therapy is not fun. They have a lot of side effects because we're targeting things uh, in the fungal cells that are similar to our own cells. So that brings us to the end of our infectious diseases of the respiratory tract. I appreciate your attention. I know there's a lot in here, but um, a lot of these are diseases that you might encounter, particularly if you are in clinical practice. So uh, I hope this was informative. Thank you for watching and I will talk to you soon.